Holding one of the uh, you know, top 10 economists living out there, been the editor of the Wall Street Journal, the head of policy at uh, the Department of the Treasury, the father of Reaganomics, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, joins us. Dr. Paul Craig Roberts .org, or Paul Craig Roberts .org, uh, is his uh, website. He's also a research fellow at the Cato Institute and the Hoover Institute. And I'm just going to stop there because his bio uh, is too long. I wanted to get him on, obviously, about what's happening with the looting of the bank accounts shock therapy, uh, the insane wars, uh, and, and a great article he wrote, as a syndicated columnist, uh, dealing with it can happen here, and I would add it has happened here. Uh, and so he joins us to cover all of this uh, information uh, here today. Doc, good to have you on with us. Well, uh, what's happening is that the handful of uh, Rich elites around the world are continuing to steal everything from everybody else. And the middle class uh, in every country is uh, disappearing. And uh, the lower class is being pushed lower. And everyone pretends uh, there's some kind of recovery and there's going to be a happy tomorrow and, and all that sort of thing. <laughs> Where do you expect this to go, what we see unfolding uh, right now in Europe? Uh, well, I would imagine that the uh, uh, members of the uh, parliament or whatever it's called in Cyprus will uh, have all their arms twisted and will be told that very dire things will happen uh, unless uh, they uh, give the okay to allowing a uh, certain percentage of uh, private depositors accounts to be seized and given to the banks. Uh, if they hold out against this, they will prove to be stronger than, uh, for example, the uh, United States Congress, uh, when the Secretary of Treasury told them that they would be uh, martial law if they didn't approve this. Uh, they'll turn out to be stronger than the Greek parliament, which also accepted the dictates from the banks. And uh, if they do uh, refuse to go along with it, then it, it's a hopeful sign. It might strengthen uh, resolve uh, in other countries like uh, Italy and Spain. Uh, <clears throat> now, if it goes through, of course, uh, it tells people that their private property in banks uh, may not be safe in any other country that has similar uh, problems or uh, bankers strong enough to uh, claim their, their property. Uh, in the United States, of course, uh, the Fed uh, has an alternative measure. Instead of seizing people's bank accounts, uh, and giving them to the uh, to, to Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan and so on, it simply prints money and gives the money to the banks. That's right. But you see, the individual countries that make up uh, the European Union and, and of course Cyprus is part of that. Uh, they do those those uh, independent those countries do not have independent central banks that can print the money uh, to give to the bankers. And the European Central Bank uh, is prohibited by its charter from doing that, but nevertheless has done some of it, but is run up against opposition from Germany, which still remembers the Weimar Republic, the inflation, and is it, just sort of fundamentally opposed to, to printing money. And so the Germans have put some sort of a restraint on how much money the ECB, the European, European Central Bank, can print. Sure. And therefore, uh, <clears throat> there's uh, not enough printing to satisfy uh, the bankers, and so they're resorted to stealing. Basically, what is going on, in my opinion, is that the uh, European Union, the bureaucracy that comprises the EU, is using the crisis to subvert the independence of the individual sovereign states that make up the EU. So the, re so the real uh, villain here is the EU bureaucracy in Brussels and the European Central Bank, which is in line with them, which, and they're making a power play to simply take over 
the budgets uh, and and the uh, authori the authoritative economic decisions of the individual countries. Sure, it's a takeover. So what does this, as an economist, someone who's worked the highest levels of government, what does it signify, the aggressive standing, uh, things going into high gear, the announcements that the NSA is spying on all of us, the announcements that domestic groups are the new terror threat, the two billion bullets, the starting fights with everybody, North Korea now threatening. I mean, I, I've studied history, you've studied history. Uh, you know, you've got, you know, uh, I mean, you've taught it and, and, and you know, taught trends at major uh, think tanks. Where do you really think it's going? Or am I wrong in saying it seems we've sped up from maybe 80 miles an hour on the road to tyranny yeah. to 120? <laughs> I think it's speeding up. Um, clearly, uh, governments are, are worried about the response of populations uh, who are being ensurfed and made to turn over their limited resources to uh, rich bankers or to the elite. That, of course, is the second uh, uh, villain in the, in the process. Uh, the point that's being established in this European crisis is that if uh, banks or financial institutions make mistakes, then it's the responsibility of the citizens of the country uh, to make those mistakes good for the banks. Exactly. To, so that the banks don't fail, and so the, the rich and the shareholders of the banks uh, don't lose their wealth or money. And back when you were on in 2008, the media had to admit we were backing them up, bailing them out. But since then, they've spun it where it's our fault. You know, the average American like myself paying over 60% taxes, that's not enough. I'm greedy, I'm bad, and, right. and, and we're in all this debt because, uh, like the head of the IMF said, we're not working six, seven days a week. I, I mean, th th this is wild. <laughs> it is. Um, and so... We have the two villains established, and we have also established the fact, I think, that the governments are concerned about the response of people. And in the United States, it looks like uh, that they, they're acting uh, far in advance of any signs uh, among the population of any kind of resistance. Sure. So you're right. We, we now have uh, uh, no civil liberties. It's up to the president whether we have them or don't. <laughs> Have them as individuals. Uh, apparently, the uh, Department of Homeland Security has shifted its attention away from so-called terrorism uh, toward uh, domestic extremists, which appears to be essentially those who disagree with the government. And we we see the militarization uh, of Homeland Security uh, of all the uh, local and state police forces. We see uh, constant uh, invasions of, of privacy, all kinds of spying that's strictly against the Constitution, and uh, it and it it continues and it deepens. Uh, we also have these reports of the um, uh, of uh, detainment uh, centers or camps built around the country with uh, uh, congressional appropriations. So uh, clearly, they. Uh, are acting to be in a position to control uh, the population in the event that there's some sort of economic or social breakdown in the United States. That's right. When we come back, I want to ask about uh, ways to get out of this, ideas for the population to, to, to try to change the debate and point out what's happening. And I also want to talk about the Dallas head of the Fed and the Kansas City head of the Fed have both recently come out and said, this is crony capitalism, this is going to destroy our future. So is that a positive sign to hear them you know, agreeing with you, Dr. Roberts? So we'll uh, come back uh, after the break and uh, talk about that. I mean, I'm trying to find some silver linings here. 14 members of Congress are now demanding Homeland Security answer their letters and questions about the 2 billion uh, rounds of bullets, the armored vehicles, the domestic checkpoints. Uh, the TSA is now making people that are double amputees basically crawl across the floor and take their prosthetic legs off. I mean, it's just, it, but then Saudi Arabians are exempt from the searches. I mean, that's mainstream news. It's just all about we're the terrorist. As we predicted they would do, they fully are flipping it now. But here was the question I was asking before the break for Dr. Uh, Paul Craig Roberts, who joins us. 
Uh, uh, Fed's Fisher, two big to fail banks are crony capitalists. That's Reuters. And uh, he goes on there to break down the fact that they are practitioners of crony capitalism and they need to be broken up and that it's going to destroy our future if we don't stop them. But again, they hold us hostage and threaten to bring us into total collapse, as you pointed out, Dr. Roberts, if we don't give in to them. But then we give in and things only get worse. And then their, their exit strategy, I guess, is martial law authoritarianism. But I don't think they're going to get away with it. I think they're crazy. Dr. Roberts. Well, uh, Alex, I don't think we count. And um, it, it's, it's very good that uh, two members of the Federal Reserve have spoken out. But it was the deregulation that produced crony capitalism. You know, it was the deregulation that allowed the banks to consolidate and uh, purchase other banks and become uh, too big to fail. And it's also uh, the case that the Secretary of the Treasury, the financial regulatory agencies, and the Federal Reserve itself uh, is run by uh, former uh, CEOs of these big banks or by their protégés. And so the banks have control of the economic policy, not us. <laughs> Uh, and, and so they're clearly going to use that power in their benefit, not in our benefit. Now, one problem that the Federal Reserve faces in its policy of supporting the banks at all costs is that we now have three massive bubbles. We have a bond market bubble in which uh, bond prices are so high that real interest rates are negative in a situation in which the Fed is printing more than one trillion new dollars every year and the government is issuing more than one trillion in new debt every year. Well, that makes no sense to have, have negative interest rates on bonds when you have massive debt monetization. So the bond market bubble is probably the biggest bubble in history. We also have a stock market bubble. Uh, all of the money that the Federal Reserve is pumping into the banks is not going out in loans. It's going into uh, uh, speculation on uh, stock market futures in various derivatives based on these futures. And that's bid up the stock market. It's not based on uh, uh, demand for products or retail sales. Retail sales have gone nowhere for years. <laughs> not real retail sales. And so we have a huge stock market bubble that's based on Fed pouring liquidity into the banks and the banks using it to speculate in stocks. So bottom line, the real economy is imploding and rotting away and being consolidated into the controlled economy that only a very few benefit uh, from. And, and, and I guess maybe Fisher and others uh, are, are now criticizing the system because they don't want to be blamed for it. I mean, is this out of fear that they realize? Well, I, I think what it is, uh, it is that, well, it could just be they have some independence of mind and some integrity. Uh, on the other hand, the Fed now has a huge problem because the third bubble is the dollar itself. Sure. So it's the stock market, the bonds, and the dollar. So the, the Fed can support uh, bond prices by buying bonds. It can support uh, stock prices by having the banks buy stock futures. <laughs> but if the dollar gets in trouble, it can't support the dollar except by raising interest rates, which would collapse the bond and stock market. <laughs> So the problem for the Fed is it keeps monetizing huge sums of debt, creating dollars at a far faster rate. The supply of dollars is growing at a faster rate than the, than the demand for dollars. And therefore, the dollar exchange rate is unstable. We got to go to break. I can tell you're getting to the key here. We're going to come back and get to that on the other side. Stay with us. Dr. Paul Craig Roberts is our guest. I'm Alex Jones. Recap the three bubbles and then where you see this leading, uh, how long it'll be, how they can prop it up. Can they pull more rabbits out of their hats? Sure.
Um, sure, go ahead. Sure. sure. Okay, look, uh, all of this is uh, also available in my latest book, which became available in English this month as an ebook. You can get it from Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble. In English, it's ebook only. Unless you read German or Chinese, there's no print version. Uh, the book explains exactly what the problem is, how we got into it, and why we're unlikely to get out of it. And uh, it's easy to read, and it's empirical based. It's uh, it's not opinion; <laughs> it's fact. Now, <clears throat> to get back to and of course uh, the title, discuss, sir. The the, the title oh, yeah, is the, the failure the of laissez-faire capitalism. That's right. It's the uh, the uh, failure of laissez-faire capitalism and economic dissolution of the West. And it's well underway. I mean, you know, the structure is already rotted out. The manufacturing capability of the United States is, is gone. It's moved offshore. And with it, as I also said would be the case, and as a, uh, 20 professors at MIT uh, validated recently, when you lose the ability to make things, you also lose the, abil the ability to invent things. So you lose the uh, innovation when you lose manufacturing. Now let's stop right there and toot your horn, not to toot your horn so people know that th this isn't a joke what they're hearing. You have been beating the drum for more than a decade that deindustrialization, uh, that, that it will never come back. Now China and others have it. And now MIT, basically the DARPA heads, I mean, that's the head of this whole military industrial complex, finally are panicking, saying, we've chopped our legs off. Uh, I mean, this is insanity, and they're now absolutely concurring with you. That's right. And also, two years ago, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, Michael Spence, he also concurred with me that the United States economy is no longer capable of producing jobs that, that produce uh, export products uh, either goods or services that we are now locked into uh, low pay domestic service jobs. And so we, I, I've had this sort of vindication from uh, very uh, high ranked uh, independent uh, economists that I, I don't know or have any association with. Now to get back to your question that we were discussing before the break, uh, there are three bubbles. We, I explained the bond and stock bubble, the dollar bubble, is what is likely to undo the whole enterprise. What has saved the Fed so far is the fact that the Europeans are in crisis, largely one we made for them, and that keeps the Euro in trouble. So as long as there's no real alternative to the dollar, except for gold and silver, which the Fed caps the price by selling naked shorts in the paper market to stop the rise in price from the demand for the fiscal metal, so, so once the uh, dollar goes, and I don't know how quick or how slow it will be, but it will go. We already know that the BRICS, uh, large countries in Asia and uh, South America, and including Russia and China, India, South Africa, Brazil, they are making agreements to no longer use the dollar to settle their international trade accounts. This reduces the demand for dollar in the international markets. The Japanese and Chinese seem to be coming to the same agreement so that they will deal with their trade in their own currencies. Which and that's called the move to the exits. What it, what it means is the demand for the dollar drops while the supply is pouring out. <laughs> and so it's very hard for the price to stay where it is. And when the price of the dollar goes down, Given that we are a, an import-dependent country, importing all kinds of things that we're dependent on, sure. prices will go up. And yet real incomes are not going up. So when the prices go up, everyone's real income goes down, consumer demand falls further, the economy sinks deeper, the deficits get bigger. So it's a perfect storm for which there are no solutions. So that's, that's beyond stagflation, isn't it? Oh, much beyond. It's uh, what, the, what the likelihood is, is an inflationary depression. Which is the ultimate nightmare.
the ultimate nightmare for which there are no policy solutions. And of course, wasn't it believed until the 70s that even stagflation was artificial and couldn't be done? But now, in the Alice in Wonderland, is not a isn't a a, 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 a hyperinflationary depression? Has that ever even happened before? I don't think so, <laughs> because you've never had this combination of of events to produce it. Uh, most depressions uh, resulted from a collapse of the money supply <clears throat> or a collapse of the exchange rate of a currency. But you've never had a situation where you have uh, no basis for employment, but you've laid the basis for an explosion of prices by creating your currency at high rates while the demand for it is is a false. Wow, and then you, sir, you've got like three different populations, that's oversimplifying, but you've got a very hardworking lower middle class and upper middle class who will work three, four jobs, have a high standard. You've kind of got a dilettante government and, and, and bureaucrat and, and, and pension fund, um, which people earned in many cases, but also these trust fund kids. And it's very popular to be mindless and, and, and be into being ignorant and to lay around all day. And then you've got the militarized uh, uh, groups out there. I mean, that just sounds like a nightmare to be in the well, middle of a population like that. What do you expect to happen when this thing starts imploding? Well, I expect that uh, what will happen when they can no longer print money to cover the deficit is they'll go after the remaining pensions. That's it, yeah. The same way that the banks go after the deposits in Cyprus, here, the government will say, well, look, your pensions have been tax-free, accumulating tax-free, and so we are now going to make up for that and take our tax share of your pensions. So they will simply uh, seize pensions. And again, it, it'll be a short-term measure. It'll only work once. <laughs> when they use the pension to finance the deficit, what do they do the next year? Just, they're going to run out of things to steal. And, and once that happens, uh, there's no... There's no way they can stave off the crisis. So they don't want to talk about this, and they don't like uh, people who do talk about it because they're trying to keep it under control as long as they can. Would you call what's coming hyperstagflation? What would the name be for it? I think I would call it uh, an inflationary depression. So an inflationary Stag depression. I think that's what I would call it, yes. Now, people think that that's a contradiction in terms, that you can't have both, uh, but you can. And particularly with these types of conditions that have been put in place, which are unique. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it doesn't do any good. We've, no, we've, we've known now for five or six years, it doesn't do any good to run big deficits and print a lot of money when all the jobs are moved offshore. So. Uh, the spending doesn't call people back to work when there's no place for them to work. All right, well, let me ask you this question. If, if, let's say we've gone out to see a Shakespearean uh, play. There's a thousand people uh, in the theater. That thousand people represents people holding dollars worldwide, governments, institutions, you name it. Yeah. Uh, how many people have gotten up and already left? Because, you know, people get up, a few leave, then all of a sudden more leave, and then suddenly, uh, you know, right before the end, half the people leave. And once half leave, you know, the bottom falls out and degenerates very quickly. What yeah. point have we gotten to uh, right now with people leaving uh, the, the theater? Because they are starting to leave the theater. Well, they've been leaving for 10 years. If you look at the sharp upturn in the price of gold and silver, during the Bush years and the first year or two of Obama, before the Fed capped it by selling naked shorts. You can see the sharp rise up. So people were leaving. And the, the Fed is trying to break that up by capping the price by selling these naked shorts. I mean, who ever heard of shorting a bull market? <laughs> no one shorts stock market when it's in a bull phase. No, you would, it's imp you ride the market up but they've been shorting a rising gold market. And so it's <laughs> clearly a control mechanism. Well, it's just, you, you said over and over again, they are colluding uh, in Europe and the United States and Asia, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, on the uh, I don't think interest the rates. Are, sure. I don't think the Asians are colluding at all. This thing they're watching. Well, I mean, at least in the fools. past, but I mean. They're watching these fools get rid of themselves. <laughs> sure, exactly. I mean, when I say Asia, I mean Japan. My point is, what does LIBOR illustrate for us? It's just another fixation of, uh, 
of interest rates. It was a minor one compared to the Fed. The Fed is the major fixer of interest rates. And what the banks were doing was just aiding the Fed. And that's why the Fed didn't do anything about it. They knew about it. It wasn't anything they didn't know about. Doc, let's shift gears. What do you make of our government putting al-Qaeda, real al-Qaeda in Libya and Syria, incredible mass murder, incredible war crimes, while separately saying now we've got to attack Syria because al-Qaeda's there? I mean, that is just a new level of Orwellianville. Uh, where do you see that going? I, I mean, how do they get away with that? I think this is the Israel lobby forcing the senators like McCain and Levin uh, to push Israel's agenda on to Obama. I, I think that's what it is. Clearly, if we, if the Assad government loses in Syria, it will be taken over by extremists because the people who are fighting are the Islamicists. Uh, if they're the ones who are opposed to the secular Assad government. They actually wear al-Qaeda uniforms. <laughs> That's right. And so what we would be doing is simply putting al-Qaeda in charge. Now, this suits Israel because it breaks up the country. It'll leave the country in a constant state of uh, civil war, just like Libya is, just like Iraq is. So when a country is at odds with itself, sure. it can't uh, present any sort of uh, outward uh, response to Israel. It's it's too overcome by its internal dispute. Sure. I mean, I, mean I, I think we get the balkanization, and I totally agree with you. My point is, how are they saying they've got to stick their hands down my wife's pants in front of me at the airport because bin Laden's in there while they run al-Qaeda publicly and gave them 10,000 heat-seeking missiles? I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, what about j j just the fact that we're running al-Qaeda publicly and it's not even an issue? Wars are profitable for the military security complex, and they're profitable for domestic power. Remember, uh, uh, Solzhenitsyn said years and years ago that the, that the main purpose of war is to create a domestic police state. Yeah, and he's absolutely right about that, the late Alexander Schultz and Eatson. You know, I got to tell you, the book, I haven't read it yet. I've read your other books, and they're all excellent. And, and there's a real libertarian system, but this isn't. Because a real libertarian system, they wouldn't be too big to fail. They would have been wiped out early on. So it's the laissez-faire with the public backing up of their losses. It, 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 I, mean, I mean, I agree it's laissez-faire, but Alex, it's a— yeah, Alex, it, yeah. it was the laissez-faire, the deregulation, that produced the crony capitalism. When you, when you remove a market from social control, you let the private greed and private power run wild. And, and the result is they monopolize things, they concentrate things, and then they are too powerful for the politicians to sit on, and they control the politicians. And as, as we've already said today, all right. Who's running the Treasury? Who's running the financial regulatory agencies? Sure. No, you're right. You're right. But let's go to the end of the banks. hour then. Let's go to the end of the hour. I've got to go to break. Six-minute segment. Let's, let's debate that. Uh, I mean, not really debate it. I understand what you're saying, but my point is if they weren't too big to fail, I agree. You can't deregulate and then back it up with government. So, so my point is, is that's the perfect storm. It's the unnatural thing, just like a inflationary depression. So, so explain it to me, because I know you know more about it than I do, and, and I concur to your, and, and I you know, defer to your wisdom. But I mean, my whole point is, I am a libertarian. I like it in most areas, and, and I understand why there was Glass-Steagall. I agree with it. My point is, is that I don't think this is pure libertarianism, laissez-faire. But explain it to me when we get back. And that they could have brokerage banks, you know, own regular banks, and then steal people's savings. I mean, we, they knew you need to build bulkheads in a ship, so if one floods, the others don't flood. And I see this, and, and Dr. Roberts and I have debated this, but I, I've seen them brag, whether it's delusional or not, at Davos and Bilderberg, that, oh, we're taking over. The world collapse will bring us to power. Then we'll come out with an SDR or something uh, above it. Uh, so I see this as orchestrated. At least they brag it's orchestrated. Maybe, maybe they're not really in control. Because one thing I've learned studying history, Hitler thought he was in control going into Russia. So did Napoleon. Th these guys get delusional. So I don't think they're infallible. I know they're men like us. They're women like us. Uh, but Dr. Roberts, you've got the floor for the last five minutes. Explain to me how this is, I mean, I haven't read the new book yet, how this is all the fault of laissez-faire, because how is it laissez-faire if government is backing it up and backstopping it? Go ahead. Well, there's no difference between the government and the, um, and the private, private interests. Look, what, uh, 
uh, what libertarians think that we have all this regulation by the government and that the whole reason we had a financial crisis is because we got too much regulation. But of course, this is nonsense. So the last 25 years have been, not just the United States, but beginning with Thatcher in England, uh, in, in uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, uh, in France. I mean, I helped the French government privatize the economy. We've had massive privatizations and massive deregulation, particular deregulation in the You need to go over there and check that answering machine? <laughs> I, I, I should have shut the door. People are very invasive. Um, I know how it is. Believe me, I've been doing radio interviews and my kids run in. <laughs> so this deregulation is really everywhere, but it's massive in terms of the financial system. It's not just that they uh, deregulated or, or repealed Glass-Steagall. They removed all of the restraints on speculation. Am I wrong in saying that you were more laissez-faire 25, 30 years ago? Have your views changed? Um, well, I get, you know, it's just like John Maynard Keynes says, when you learn the facts, what do you do? You adjust your views. <laughs> so I so, so are you thing. saying Reaganomics? Just a minute, Alex, this has nothing to do with ideology. It has to do with facts. Sure. Okay. And the facts are we had a highly regulated financial system. We had no problems. We completely deregulated and we're in massive collapse for which there's no solution and which is threatening the entire Western world. This I'm, is all sure. due to deregulation. And so what is laissez-faire? It is the absence of regulation. And so what we have learned is that the absence of regulation does not produce libertarian nirvana. It produces social instability, social insecurity. And that is why throughout history, almost every market is regulated. There are very few cases and they are short term of deregulated markets because they are unlivable. They always produce crisis. And that's why the regulation comes in. It doesn't come in because the government's trying to take away power. It's because people are trying to have some kind of economic stability and economic security. Sure, sure, but what Today, about- they've got none. Sure, no, I mean, I, I understand that. My issue is it's government that allowed them to grow this big to begin with. I understand it's the laissez-faire that caused it, but then the backing it up allows them to enslave us. You know, we get Ron Paul on about once a month and I really respect him, but I'm gonna bring this up to him because he's laissez-faire and he's gonna say, but Alex, we backed up too big to fail. The regulators were controlled by the bankers, and they actually wouldn't let other competition come in. It wasn't real true deregulation. So, 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 Dr. Roberts, I agree that the idea of laissez-faire capitalism pushed by Greenspan and everybody, we were just talking during the break, has led to a lot of this. But, but all I'm saying is now they'll take over with no regulation, then put regulation on everybody else selectively once they've already sewed up the game. I mean, answer my question on that if you uh, can. I mean, I know you can, but give me your brief take on my question. How is it laissez-faire if government's backing it up? Laissez-faire is what produced it. I'm talking about the failure of the system. It's now failed. Yes, I get that. Okay. Because you remember, it was Greenspan and Rubin and uh, Arthur Levitt, the head of the SEC, and uh, Larry Summers, who went to Congress and prevented Brooksley Bourne from doing her job and regulating the derivatives. Remember that? Yes. She said, if we don't regulate these derivatives, we're going to have a crisis. And they all went down there and said, don't let this crazy woman regulate derivatives. She'll produce a crisis. Markets are self-regulated. I remember. Need to this was an ideology. The ideology came out of the success of Reagan and the failure of the Soviet Union. And so everybody said, oh, well, it was Reagan. He was for free markets. The Soviets were for planning and regulation, and they failed, and we won. So let's don't have any regulation. That's right. You're kind of their guru, aren't you? It, let's don't have any. And so they had done. They got rid of it progressively. And the result was the monopoly concentration, the banks too big to fail, the takeover. That is always the result of the deregulation. I'm not, 
you understand it's a process. No, I've got it. And we're in the middle of it. It's a fact. And, 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 and now ideology is just window dressing. In the two minutes we've got left, if you were king using the Constitution, what would you do now to try to reverse this? Or is it too late? I think it's too late. You know, it's too late. It's, it's going to hit the fan. I just don't know when. I can't predict the timing. We've got three massive bubbles. There's no way out. They're going to pop. They have to pop. And, and, and of course, pop. one will pop the other. So we'll have triple bubble implosion. If the dollar goes, all of them will pop. And it'll be the biggest financial wipeout in world history. And it will, we won't be able to recover. The Chinese are not going to say, oh, here, let us rebuild your economy and give you everything back. Uh, they're in trouble too, as well. I mean, they're they're barely. Uh, I mean, they're growing faster, but you know, they got their own problems. Well, they have some problems, but they don't have ours. They don't. They're not monetizing a trillion dollars of debt every year. They're not printing money faster than. Sure, uh, sure. Before. They're not going to be able. Is what I'm saying to help us. Uh, why would they help us? Exactly, you know, but even if they wanted to. We're we're trying to surround them with military bases. We're going to cut. The social welfare net because we don't have any money but we've got plenty of money to attack syria oh yeah and 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 therein is their answers the bankers are going to start world war three uh the neocons the bank the, the israel lobby the bankers the military security complex they're going to start world war three yeah but they won't be able to fight it very long because you, a nuclear it'll go nuclear and uh you can't fight nuclear wars very long, and if it doesn't go nuclear, we'll go broke and not be able to Wow, fight wow, long. and you were there in the negotiation with the Soviets, everything. I mean, I cannot say how much you know, sir, and how much we appreciate you with us. And to hear you saying that when all my other experts are saying the same thing, I'm pretty smart. I see the same thing. I see government digging in like it's the end of the world. This doesn't look too good. <laughs> they're, they're preparing to control us, but our response to all of the crisis and mistakes that they're making and so they obviously don't intend to correct them or they wouldn't be putting in no, all these No, no, they don't. Uh, get the book the at Amazon. Get the book at Amazon. Doctor, thank you so much for the hour. Ask yourselves, what are you doing in this time of great challenge? What are you doing to unlock minds?